Hello, everybody, and good morning, and welcome to this webcast. Hopefully, you can all hear me. Um, so this webcast today is uh, essentially about heart bleed outpatient care. Um, quick introduction to myself. Uh, I'm Joel Barnes. I'm one of the uh, senior systems engineers here at Tripwire. Um, I've been with Tripwire about four years. Prior to that, I was with uh, Symantec for four years. So I've been working in this uh, side, of, side of space for a long time. Um, so this presentation, although Heartbleed has been about for a while, um, I'm going to be concentrating around, you know, obviously what it is, a quick refresh if you don't know already, and then start looking at a whole bunch of stuff around how you fix it. Now, then more important than probably all of that at the moment is how do you prepare yourself in case something like this comes around again? So it's the prevention of the next one that's coming through as well. So if we just sort of uh, skip through... Um, I kind of covered this off already, but uh, what, is it, what is it, if you don't know already, how did it happen, how can it be used, um, how is it actually impacting the business that you're in, or what is the potential impact of that business? Um, what are the systems are vulnerable, how do you check it? There's a variety of different ways, there's freeware tools, there's all sorts of other things out there. Um, we as Tripwire have solutions that can assist with that, and we'll go through some of those. Um, and then... Finally, I'll sort of wrap all of this up and start looking at how Tripwire can help with all of these different areas. So not only, you know, prevention of it, but also looking at how we can fix, help fix it, detect it, all of that side of things. So with that, let's sort of scoot through and give a quick um, sort of review, essentially. Um, Heartbeat's been out for kind of like a month. Um, so most people would have fixed it by now, or at least they should have done. Um, so what was it? Well, it was an open SSL vulnerability in one of the open source libraries. Um, they reckon it had been around for about two years. Affected up to, well, various different figures are sort of been banding around, but two-thirds of the internet, half the internet or more. Um, exploits are already available and have been for ages um, because it's a fairly simple thing to exploit. Um, and it's also possible that you may have been exploited. And that's kind of, uh, or compromised even, um, and that's probably the, the bigger issue because prior to any of the detection tools going in, if you have been compromised, you may never ever have known about it because it won't end up in any of the logs that you've got. So that's kind of one of the problems that we have to address with this site, um, with this type of uh, vulnerability. Quickly, how does it work? Well, uh, this is uh, XKCD, um, excellent strip if you want to go and have a look at it. Um, Essentially, it's a, a request, a uh, response from a server. I tell it how big I need that response to be. It sends it back again. And I just basically say, I want more data. So I say, send me, you know, uh, respond to me with something that should be two characters, and I ask for 5,000 characters. And basically what tends to come back is everything that's in the subsequent memory space. So what that means, unfortunately, is that you can get hold of huge swathes of data that can be very, very useful. So it could be the encryption key for um, the communication. It could be anything else as well. So you could end up with username's password, you could do decryption, you can do all sorts of other fun things on there, depending on what you get back. Now, one of the interesting things about it is it, it doesn't conform to, what, to the sort of standard exploit that you'd see. So... Um, this is, I believe, a Lockheed Martin side of things, but it's the cyber kill chain for sophisticated attacks. And the idea behind it is that there's um, a reconnaissance and enumeration phase, there's a weaponization or exploitation phase, there's a command and control phase, and then there's actions and exfiltration from that. So that's kind of, you know, a typical, if you're going to get compromised or breached, that's a typical set of steps that a hacker or a, you know, a nefarious party would go through. Um, this is a, an example of uh, the exploit actually in the wild. So you can see the heartbeat response on the bottom here. It's very easy to do. This was just run through a sandbox internally here. Um, very easy. We can grab the data out of there. No problem whatsoever. The cyber kill chain from Lockheed Martin, and there's lots of other sort of methodologies and, and designs around how attackers take place. But ultimately, there's these sort of typical steps. The problem with the heartbleed vulnerability was that you didn't have to go through that chain. So there was, there was very limited scope for you to pick it up as you went through. 
So, you know, they didn't need to weaponize it. They didn't need to get command and control of a server to actually do something to it. Or they just basically sat there and just read the memory straight off the box. So it's, there were no indicators that it had taken place. It was a really simple exploit, and it was everywhere. So the problem is, is that with that sort of, those sort of characteristics, it's very difficult for people to understand where they're vulnerable and what's been compromised. So it's fixing it, and then dealing with the aftermath of what was compromised is very difficult because you don't know what it was. So who was affected? Well, a, a whole bunch of people. This is just um, a slide of big names, really. There was a load of people compromised. You know, it's more sort of who wasn't affected. Um, every customer of mine was affected in some way. Um, because they're all running OpenSSL somewhere within applications or whatever. Um, or they're reliant on third-party applications who are also running OpenSSL. So it's a very different view of what we need to do. It was everywhere. And getting to where it was is, is kind of critical. So with that in mind, there needs to be a sort of methodology behind how we address these various different uh, components of this, of this particular vulnerability. So there's three sort of gaps um, in the enterprise. There's a detection gap, which we need to sort of address. So um, the time between the actual breach and the discovery of the breach, um, which is sort of highlights the question of have we actually been breached? And there's some interesting statistics around that talk about this uh, detection gap. In that typically, if you are breached, the detection gap is usually, if you look at the Verizon Data Breach Report and things like that, um, you're looking at days, weeks, months before someone notices. So that's, absolutely, that's a real, you know, if you do not know that you have been breached, then you don't know what's being exfiltrated, you don't know a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so, you know, the answer to the question of, hey, Mr. IT security guy, have we been breached? The answer is yes, or not as far as I'm aware. The answer is probably not no, because absolutely categorically saying no means that you have to absolutely know everything that's happening in your environment, which is very, very difficult. So, the detection gap is one that you absolutely need to reduce as much as possible. And there's lots of tools out there that can assist you, where you can start looking at IDS, IPS, you can look at all your SIM stuff, you can look at various different, you know, sniffing uh, packages across the wire and all the fun stuff. So there's things that you can do to help with that. Ultimately, it becomes a, can you see? Do you have visibility into your network and what's taking place on there? Um, then there's the remediation gap that tends to take place. So once you've discovered it, how do you fix it? And that's got a whole bunch of subcomponents in it. It's probably beyond the scope of this particular webcast. Because how bad is it? Well, there's a whole slew of things in here. So do I, is it just a single thing that I need to replace? Or is it a compromise of a whole bunch of systems where I need to take all these systems offline, I need to analyze them, I need to see whether that's been replicated elsewhere? Lots of different things in there. And the Restoring um, Trust After a Breach webcast that we delivered a month or so ago would be something that I would look at if you want to start looking at that remediation gap because there are processes you need to go through to get to a known good state that you can then start going from there. And then the prevention gap, which is how do we avoid this happening again? Um, and they're all linked together essentially, particularly the remediation and prevention. So for example, cleaning up the system and, and for remediation and putting it straight back into service without actually you know, reinforcing it, changing its configurations, making it more secure, isn't reducing the prevention side of things. It's just saying, hey, look, we put a vulnerable system, we cleaned it, we put a vulnerable system back. You know, that's not going to help anyone. So preventative measures are absolutely vital to go in here. And a lot of all of these different things, we look through the enterprise threat gap, um, it's all about knowledge of what's on your network, what's taking place, what's sitting there, can you see it? Can you see it in a timely fashion? So, for actual detection, um, Tripwire Log Center um, can help with our, the real-time detection. There, is, there are many SIMs out there. Obviously, I'm from Tripwire, so I'm going to talk about ours. But ultimately, it's all about looking at information from sources that can detect 
potential exploits going onto your systems. So you look at creating alerts, automating remediation, getting reports out there to show where you're being attacked. Look at you know, all the correlation points from all your IDSs, IPSs, looking at things like Cisco, SourceFire, Snort. You know, all of these different technologies are seeing all of these different things. So if they're seeing packets going through that are requesting all sorts of other you know, nefarious things to exploit Heartbleed, great, we can then see. However, the problem with these is that they're probably going to be fairly you know, broad, so they may well be attacking things that are not vulnerable, at which point you've got a noise issue. So typical graphical example of this, an exploit comes in, an IDS picks that up, it goes to a vulnerable host, Tripwire Log Center sees that, and we output it, and we ping actions and alerts out, or we get reports together to, to, do, to essentially tell you how far down the line you've got to go, where it's being sent to, all of these other things in there. However, what you really need to do is actually start making it more intelligent than that. And that's where getting a vulnerability management component within this flow is absolutely vital. Um, if we sort of step back ever so slightly, this is just generically, if we forget about Heartbleed and then just think about how SIMs work, it's all about context around what's going on. So if someone's trying to exploit a vulnerability on that system, and you can see from you know, an IDS that the exploit is pointed at a system, but that system doesn't, isn't vulnerable to that exploit, is that something you need to know about or be alerted on? Or is it something that you just need to archive so that you know maybe where the exploit has come from so you can deal with it, but you don't need to worry about the end system that's being attacked. It's exactly the same with using Tripwire Log Center and Tripwire IP360, whereby here what we're doing is we're taking vulnerability information from IP360, integrating it with Tripwire Log Center so that when an exploit comes through, we can see if you're actually vulnerable to that exploit or not. Because if you're not vulnerable to the exploit, you don't need to be alerted on it because it's not going to take any effect. So Context is king around all of these various different things. So just to give you, you know, for those of you on the call who are not Tripwire customers, um, IP360, it's automated scanning um, and vulnerability management, and it's for continuous prevention. So we're actually on the prevention side of things here. So what do you do? Automated inventory of devices and applications. So again, I spoke earlier about do you know what you own? If you don't know what you own, you don't know what's installed on it, then you cannot protect yourself against vulnerabilities against it. So that's you know, your foundational security stuff. Um, and then, obviously, in this specific instance around Heartbleed, we have a whole bunch of Heartbleed checks out there that will go out and essentially see where you are vulnerable to, these, uh, to the vulnerabilities. But you've got to be quite careful, because a lot of people are just looking at... Um, your endpoints and or your internet facing your perimeter networks hardly doesn't just live there um, it lives almost everywhere so you need to not only look at the perimeter so essentially external scanning but you also need to look at the internal side of things and if you take it from there it's looking inside your corporate network it's looking at data centers it's looking at people who are you know doing test bed stuff you've got dev people who don't bother patching their systems you've got all sorts of things internally that you also need to look at and then you've got the fun of the fact that it might exist between multiple parties so i have an application that runs but it's taking a third party feed from somewhere outside it's got an embedded link to a third party that i have no control over how do I make sure that my data, although I may have secured my side of things and you know, mitigated that vulnerability, do I know that my third parties have? Or do I know that you know, the three calls going through into my data center from the outside, every single one of those is, uh, has been fixed? Otherwise, you're essentially leaving very, very weak links everywhere. So getting a holistic view of this is incredibly difficult because you need to understand what your network looks like and how these applications talk to each other as well. So getting hold of all of that information is absolutely vital. And that's where things like IP360 can come in. So here you can see, you know, I've got all these various different components and I can see the little heartbleed issues sitting between a whole bunch of systems. And they could be external as well. 
So it really is this kind of getting hold of all of this data is very tricky. So one of the things that um, the Council of Cybersecurity looks at are the critical security controls, and there's tw the top 20 of them. They were the SANS top 20 critical security controls, and now the Council of Cybersecurity has picked those up as well. Um, and the first one is, or the first four, essentially, which are the, are the key ones that we're going to look at here, are um, what hardware do you have, what software do you have, or applications do you have sitting on that, um, what, uh, how are they all configured, and how vulnerable are they? They're the first four sort of foundational controls. Um, critical security control number two is an inventory of authorized and unauthorized software. But you need to look at that in a variety of different areas. So it's on the perimeter network. So you're looking at web servers, email servers, FTP servers, anything that has some level of authentication virus itself. So um, look for specific versions. So you can do this in a variety of different ways once we get there. But Look at your databases. Look at your application servers in your data center. You, need, you can't miss anything here. Um, and then look at the internal network as well, operating systems, any VPN clients. You know, you've got people VPNing through it. If they're vulnerable, then VPN becomes essentially useless. So it was a real eye-opener for a lot of people, the heart bleed, because you realize just how vulnerable you can be um, and how much something like that pervades across everything. So it's very basic and we take it for granted, particularly with the open source side of things, expecting it to have been vetted and things like that. And don't forget, I haven't put it on this slide, but don't forget that there's the interoperational stuff as well. How do you look for third parties and you know, embedded links and all those sort of fun things? So what do you need to do? Scan your perimeter networks. That's pretty easy to do. You could, there's stuff out there that can do it for you. Uh, Tripwire obviously provide tools to do that, things like SecureScan and PureCloud. We can do all those sorts of things. Um, you also need to scan the internal network. So again, there are vulnerability scanners out there. Tripwire offer IP360. Look at all the internal stuff. Kill, those, kill that heartbleed um, very easily from that. You also need to look for two. You can look in two different ways. So you can look for a remote check which essentially looks from the outside in and tries to you know, look at what's listening on whatever port and try and, and try and see if that is responding in a way that indicates that it's uh, a um, vulnerable system. Very easy to do, there's lots of stuff. Um, but also look for local checks because there's stuff that's out there that you just don't know necessarily. So there may be stuff that's out there that may not be running, so you cannot see it, but it's there. So you need to go and look at local checks. So this is essentially remotely logging into a system and looking for specific version numbers that are running or that are in place. Because the last thing you want to do is say, right, I've, I've scanned everything without using any credentials. I've just gone out and looked for all of the different ports that I'm interested in and I found all, in inverted commas, of my hardly vulnerable systems. Then someone goes and, you know, enables the open SSL on something else and suddenly you're vulnerable again. So you need to make sure that not only are you looking at stuff that's actually live now, but all the stuff that's potentially live as well. So that's where you need to start doing your credential-based scanning. And this is where not doing credential-based scanning is a real risk to the business because not doing credential-based scanning will miss a whole bunch of stuff that you need to do. And then continue to do it. So if you don't do the credential-based stuff, then you have a possible risk. You can mitigate that by continually scanning so that if something new comes up or someone installs an old version or something like that, then you will see it, hopefully, very, very quickly. One of the other sides of things is, and what we've seen, is actually um, people patching incorrectly. So, ah, I'm vulnerable to Heartbleed. I'll go out and I'll quickly download the patch and I'll patch my version of OpenSSL on that particular system. We've actually seen in various areas an increase in vulnerability across the internet in various in select areas because people are patching with the wrong versions. They're actually introducing because they don't realize the version numbers they're actually on. So continuously scanning, the last thing you want to do is introduce Heartbleed back into your organization. So make sure you know exactly what version you've got. That gives you um, from, usually from your local scanning, so getting those credentials and actually logging in and seeing specifically what version, but continue to scan as well. So if someone decides to 
you know, they've installed the, the latest version but then realize they need to patch and have accidentally downgraded or, or whatever, um, that you see it as soon as it happens. And that continuous prevention is essentially what we should be doing regardless. This is your detection gap that you're looking at as well. It's making sure that you can see when vulnerable things are coming in. So if you're not a tripwire vulnerability management customer, so you're not using IP360, um, we provide a, and I'm not a sales guy quite obviously, a free tool um, that you can use. So you can, it's free for up to 100 IPs, um, you can scan four times a month. It's designed for automated scanning for internal networks. From what we can see, um, if you've got less than 100 IPs, then you shouldn't be paying for something that's fairly simple to do. So here you have something that you can just go ahead and use. Um, it does both remote and local heart bleed checks. So it's essentially running our uh, industry-leading IP360 engine back, in, back with us. Um, and we can do web FTP, IMAP, POP3, all sorts of things on there. So we're using our enterprise class scanning engine. All we're doing is we're running it through a browser so that you can then go and scan over it your own internal system. And you just register and away you go. We're not going to charge you any money for it. It's absolutely fine. And the link is um, there as well. So just to give you a quick idea, idea here, we've got secure scan. We create a new scan profile, which is just our list of IPs. So we can say, install the connector in here. We install it. We've got a list of Windows boxes or target devices here. Pretty simple stuff. You can, run, you can schedule it to run. So you can, you know, if you've got a home network, for example, you can just go use this. I, in fact, I use it on my own home network and get quite scared occasionally. But the idea is, is that this just happens every, you know, every week. I just see what's happening on my home network and I can then make changes. I can you know, disable things. I can go and patch things. It just gives me some peace of mind at home. So there we go. I just click on the run button here and away it goes. So it goes out and it will run a full vulnerability scan against my systems. And it can be both local and remote uh, checks as far as, because we're running it essentially from a browser, that connector will go out and it can either automatically log into your other systems or it can just do remote checks on there. It comes back and we have a whole bunch of reports that are available. So it will show you the level of risk on your systems. And there we have, you know, a report, an example report of a home network. So I can see here that I do have, you know, some vulnerable systems. How vulnerable are they? Well, I've got some that have got a high level of vulnerability on there. So that is the sort of thing you can then drill into and drive fixing of all these different things. And that's kind of the, the killer piece for all of this side of things. Is if you could get the information that you need, you can take an action and fix them. Getting information that just says, you know, you have 2,000 systems that are you know, of high criticality, high vulnerability risk, sorry, doesn't really help you because you can't fix 2,000 systems overnight. Getting a, you know, a ordered list of how uh, vulnerable they are, so high could be very high, very, very high, very, very, very high. Knowing that ordered list allows you to focus in and take action very quickly. Secure scan is just a way of us delivering this to you free of charge um, that you can then go and use against any, num uh, any subset of 100 systems. So what coverage do we have? Well, the Heartbleed um, remote check, the Heartbleed TLS is, is the basic one, making sure that we're you know, able to remotely check for all of the uh, vulnerable systems out there. But also we look at certificate risk, all the POP3 IMAP FTP, Debian stuff, all the PostgreSQL stuff. And then we also look for the local check. So OpenSUSE, anything on Oracle Linux, Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat, OpenVPN, a whole variety of different um, checks in there that allow you to just go out and find out what's there. So if you haven't done this already, and I would expect that the vast majority of the people on this call have done this already, um, then this is the sort of thing that you may want to continually do to make sure no one's introducing anything new. Um, and if you haven't done it, um, you might want to go ahead and do that, just as a sort of quick recommendation there, or stating the obvious as it's known. Um, 
all of these uh, for Heartbleed, but we have over 60,000 other checks as well. So if you use the, the IP360 or Secure Scan, then we will check for over 60,000 vulnerabilities, including the Heartbleed stuff. So it's not just a Heartbleed thing, it's far more than that, looking at getting into your vulnerability management space as well. So, what do you do to fix it? Well, you know, the visibility piece is absolutely critical. Where does it exist? How do you fix it? Well, it's a fairly simple fix ultimately. Update OpenSSL to 1.0.1G or higher. You know, F, was, F and lower was the vulnerable version, so get the latest version. Contact the vendor for a fix if they haven't fixed it already. Um, you can revoke, updating or revoking your certificates as a precaution. Um, you should probably be doing this anyway and checking all these things, but as a precaution, it's always a good thing to do. And we've all been asked to change passwords. I'm pretty sure you know, I'm getting countless emails through from various different websites I've registered at saying, you may have had your passwords compromised, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's always good to do that anyway. You know, a corporate, there's corporate stuff about changing passwords every you know, X amount of days, but we never kind of enforce it on you know, sort of website users and things like that. Sometimes it's always a good idea to get people to revise them every year or whatever, depending on the level of risk you see there. Um, you're never going to do any harm other than possibly reputational by asking people to do that. However, if you're going to ask users to revise their passwords, do it after you've patched, not before. Otherwise, it's completely pointless. So, how do we prevent this? First of all, know where it exists. If you don't know where it exists, you cannot do anything. Visibility is key, and it doesn't matter whether we're talking Heartbleed or anything else. If you do not know what is happening or existing on your network, you cannot fix it, you cannot do anything with it. Check, check all your perimeter networks, check your internals, check your link networks, if you can. Be careful with the link networks. You know, there are legal issues around going and trying to exploit Heartbleed on other people's networks to find out if they are uh, vulnerable. Better just to ask them and get some level of commitment from them in there. But knowing where they are would be the critical piece. And then patch both the remote and any local vulnerabilities as well. So you know, anything that's currently you know, uh, advertising uh, an open SSL connection, then you need to fix that immediately. But look at all the local stuff that's maybe not visible um, from an external point and get those fixed as well. Again, the key thing really is how do you um, see all of what you've got? So IP360, um, quick summary of that. We released coverage on April the 9th, the day after it was released. Um, sorry, the day after it was uh, publicised it existed. Uh, released additional heartbeat checks on April the 15th. There's 17 different checks on there. IP360 is an on-premise solution, for those of you who don't know. We also have a cloud-based perimeter scanning solution called PureCloud. Um, if you need anything from that, feel free, contact Tripwire. We're more than happy to speak to you, as I'm sure you're well aware. So that's you know, one of the key pieces in here. However, I want to sort of quickly skip back to look at the intelligent vulnerability management, because there is more to it than just looking at a quick fix for a, uh, a uh, vulnerability that is in the wild that we need to exploit, that could be exploited, sorry. Just fixing that one thing doesn't really help. You end up playing sort of whack-a-mole on these things and just, you know, oh, there's another one, I'll run around and with my hair on fire and I'll fix that. It's all about getting, being more intelligent about these different things. Otherwise, you get swamped with work. Like anything you have, the more information you get, the more you have to deal with. So the more context you need around that information to allow you to make a decision about whether you need to act or not. So we've already talked about Tripwire Log Center, Tripwire IP360, bringing those together. So we see from some IDS or whatever, um, a, someone trying to exploit Heartbleed on our systems, we can see using IP360 whether that system is even vulnerable to that exploit. At which point we can then take an informed decision rather than just a decision about what we do with it. The other side of things is where we start looking at getting bridging the entire threat gap, where we can actually say, let's get Tripwire Enterprise into here as well and start looking at what's happening on that system. So if someone's exploiting things and just gaining credentials, for example, then we need to know about that. 
and that's what IP360 and Tripwire Log Center will do. But Tripwire Enterprise will look at if they're actually trying to, you know, using those credentials to get onto that system and actually do something. So we're now starting to look at a far more holistic approach um, about how we address general vulnerability and security. So not only looking at um, you know, all the events in the organization, but also looking at the vulnerability side of things, and then what's happening on the systems themselves. Trying to get a sort of system state intelligence around what's happening around the system, what's happening um, with the interactions with the system, and then what's happening on the system itself. So it's very easy to go and bring this. So what Trevor Enterprise will bring in is how bad is it? So you know, this is part of the remediation process. So obviously we've got an inventory of where all these, this heart bleed, the heart bleed exists, but we also got inventories of other things in there. So we want to start looking at all of the affected systems with the applications and network devices, anything that's on there that may have been compromised as a result of someone exploiting the heart bleed vulnerability. Because just gaining credentials and stuff is fine. And there's, there's data exfiltration and things like that that people will use. But there's also making use of that data to do something more nefarious than just that sort of thing. So there is certainly the option of making use of the data that they've got to actually start doing proper data exfiltration, command and control, all those other things that are part of that cyber kill chain. In there. So what are we doing here? We're essentially starting to look for further indications that someone has moved further into the organization. So we're trying to essentially kind of you know, trip them up, hence the name Tripwire. It's where Tripwire initially came from, was looking at you know, what's changing on systems? What are people doing on those systems? Because that is of interest. You know, making sure that you know, people have to stay as far away as possible and if we can see them on there. So these various different things we're doing, we're now watching for change. So seeing, putting all these tripwires in place so that we can actually see if someone is going to uh, take advantage of our systems, we've got vulnerable systems out there that, we now get, that have been exploited, what's happened on them? Because part of that remediation gap is setting things back to how they were. So, you know, we already talked about Heartbleed essentially not making changes to systems, so that's fine. But, you know, if, by the time you've seen something that's happened, because it's been in the wild for so long, they may well have already done something. So they may have well use the information they've gained from there to actually make changes elsewhere. So this is where we start, you know, Tripwire Enterprise can come in and give you that information around what is happening on a system. So what's changed? Look at whether it was authorised change, unauthorised change. Did it happen at the right time? Was there a change ticket in there? All that fun stuff around what changes are acceptable versus unacceptable. Um, look at who changed it and uh, when. So was it, you know, just whilst we were vulnerable? Was it after we were vulnerable? If it was done before we, were, we knew we were vulnerable, is that something that we need to look at elsewhere as well? Because this is, again, it's just more context around what you do. And it also allows us to secure our systems directly. So we're going to have, you know, standard builds out there. So they should be maintained as well. So if you see something change that essentially reduces the level of security on a system, say someone starts up another service or opens up another port or does some stuff that we should wouldn't expect, that way we can immediately start changing those things back and start making sure that we are maintaining a known good standard on here. And that gives you a whole bunch of uh, benefits around things. So how that system is configured and maintained, although you know, if you had a, a vulnerable version of OpenSSL on there, then it would, you, know, you couldn't do anything about that. But once, you know, if someone has exploited it and is now using that information to further penetrate your organization, you'll be able to see what they're doing. And that's part of the remediation because you can essentially then change back all the things that they've done. So it's a very um, holistic way of viewing these things. And here we can see overall how well we are doing. So this is actually um, some Tripwire Enterprise checks that are designed specifically to go out and look for uh, vulnerable versions of the OpenSSL libraries. So go out look at all these things from a Tripwire Enterprise point of view. So if you have got Tripwire Enterprise, if you're a current customer, we have policy checks and rules that will go out and specifically look for that. Um, if you want to get hold of them, have a chat with our support guys or contact your sales uh, team 
um, and they'll be able to get those through to you. So it's kind of, you know, you can use some of the free tools out there. You can use SecureScan to go and find it. If you've got Tripwire Enterprise, we can do it for you or that. There's lots of different ways of addressing specifically around the Heartbleed side of things. So we've got policies out there that will essentially show you all of your assets that you've got covered by Tripwire Enterprise, which ones are vulnerable for OpenSSL. Okay, so if we look at just where Tripwire fit within this uh, threat gap, in the detection side of things, it's Tripwire Log Center. It's the incidents, that, sorry, um, the incidents that we see based on other things telling us stuff. So consolidating data from IDS, from you know, any other NetFlow side of things, all these various different bits of technology that will look at these things, and then provide context alerting around. Um, with IP360 integrated into the Tripwire Log Center, we can essentially tell you what systems are vulnerable so that you're not going to get a, you know, a false positive on these various different things. Because one of the problems with any log management, security and event management tool is noise, false positives, all that sort of stuff. The more context you can get around an asset, the better, because you can make a more informed decision about what that means. Then there's the remediation gap. So looking with Tripwire Enterprise, we can actually see what's changed on systems and make sure that you know, things are updated when they should be. Any out-of-band changes are notified so we can push them back. And obviously we can go and look for um, a vulnerable versions of OpenSSL and be able to start fixing those as well. Um, and then the prevention piece is all about making sure you know where you are, keeping things patched and up-to-date. All of that side of things, which is where IP360 comes in. So we can then look at what you've got out there, what hardware is on there, what software and applications are sitting on that hardware, how vulnerable it is, on an ongoing vulnerability management basis. So it's not just an assessment, fire and forget. It's not just a, hey, here's your you know, 5,000 SEV fives. It's a very granular system of making sure that you know exactly what your most vulnerable systems are and that you can go and fix those as a priority. Every single component here is around giving you context and actionable items within there. Just giving you information and you just sit there and go, thanks, isn't what we're about. Because that's just, that doesn't help. You need things that you can actually take actions upon. And that's what the whole of the Tripwire uh, portfolio is all about. Driving positive action within the organization. So I've kind of covered this already, because jumped ahead. Um, receive improvised systems, intelligent alerts, the scan, um, prevention, scan, discovery, uh, pinpoint heartbeat wherever it may be. And again, just as a sort of reiteration, do it continuously. People will suddenly spin up a box they haven't had for ages or they'll open a VM. So they thought, oh, I just suspended that ages ago and I need to go back in and quickly do something. That gives you an exploit. You need uh, vulnerability. You need to know these things. You cannot just do it on a you know, quarterly basis or something like that. It needs to be more... Um, continuous than that. And for Tripwire Enterprise, we have, we can, you can run auto remediation on here as well with workflow. So when we see something that's failed, we can have a remediation script that can run and actually go and fix stuff in there. So make the most of what you've got. If you haven't got these things, I'm sure there'll be other things in your environment that perform similar or complementary um, actions. Have a look at those. Make sure you're actually taking action on all of these. So, other resources that are here, there is SecureScan, which um, anyone can just register for, download, and use. That's all it is. It's, you know, as a home user, you can use it. As a corporate user, you can use it up to 100 IPs, four scans a month. So, you can scan weekly across 100 IPs, absolutely fine. You can even designate what those specific IPs are if you want to. You don't have to use a range. You can do whatever you like. Um, Take a look on our, our VERT team. So we have a, a specific team, um, the Vulnerabilities and Exposures research team, whose job it is to uh, investigate vulnerabilities, uh, to find them, but also to, when they are found, to work out how to fix them, how to detect them. They have a huge amount of information um, on there. They're very good. There's all sorts of blog posts they've done as well. Recommend taking a look at those guys. Um, there's a blog post here. Um, the State of Security... Um, uh, blog that we have to tripwire.com slash state of security 
um, has a huge amount of articles around not just Hartley, but all different areas of security, um, from non-IT security all the way through to you know, very technical things around some of the vert team put in. Worth going and having a look in. There's one there that's got um, detecting heartbeat exploits in real time. Maybe very pertinent. Maybe a little behind the times now because we're a month down the line. But certainly worth looking at. Um, also looking at home routers. This is a very interesting point whereby there are lots of people have home routers. Home routers, if you buy one off Amazon or other um, online retailers are available, uh, they tend not to be updated. So if you've got an, you know, you've got an HTTPS page where you're using remote admin on your router, there's not many of them are actually doing firmware updates or letting you know how to do that. So for those of people who are not particularly IT savvy, but savvy enough to be able to you know, go out, buy an interesting router, get it connected, oh, I want to you know, do something remote, I'll just enable that, check those out. That's exactly what the secure scan stuff is all about. Check your own router at home whether that is vulnerable. Because if anyone gets onto your home network, then they'll be able to exploit it. If you enabled remote access online and someone can access from externally, they can then compromise it. And you really don't want that to take place. So focus in. Start thinking outside of just the corporate stuff. Start thinking about all the other things that affect you personally as well. Um, obviously, um, hit, uh, if you're a customer, lots of stuff on our customer portal. Don't be afraid to reach out to our support guys. They can assist you, particularly with things like um, Tripwire Enterprise rules and policies for Heartbleed if you need them. Always good to, you know, if you're going to put these in, you can then show how well you are doing to whoever is you know, interested in all these different things. Uh, OpenSSL.org, obviously. Um, Heartbleed.com and um, the CVE details at MITRE.org. So, MITRE, you know, look for all the CVEs. It gives you a whole bunch of details. You've probably already got that, um, but it's there. So, with that, I've come to the end of what I wanted to cover today. Um, I've spoken a lot. I've spoken very fast, um, for which I apologize if uh, you've missed anything. Um, are there any questions that you may have? Um, if there are, please enter them into the um, uh, uh, the portal, and we'll have a look. So, someone, um, the first question has come through, which is, uh, we have Tripwire Enterprise 7.7. .7. Will it be able to identify Heartbleed vulnerability? As far as I'm aware, the answer is yes to that. Um, the rules that run for are not particularly um, complex. They're just looking for very simple things and being able to assess on those. Um, check with the support guys. Uh, get hold of those, the rules. Um, and they'll be able to assist with those sides of things. So that's good. Um, however, I would um, always stress that if you've got 7.7, you might want to upgrade anyway, um, because we're quite along with a lot of versions further down than that, with 8.3 being the current version. There's lots of cool stuff in later versions of Tripwire Enterprise that you'll make, find will make your life easier. So not wanting to be pushy, but if you're on support, it's free in inverted commas. I'll give it a few more minutes for any other questions. Otherwise, I'll just uh, close it off. So we'll give it a couple of minutes. Um, So someone's um, asked a question of, can you explain how Heartbleed works internally? What sort of level or iteration of the SSL protocol it exploits? Um, I'm not um, a member of the VERT team specifically. Um, so I know what versions of OpenSSL it works, but if you go to the um, VERT uh, link that I gave earlier, um, let me skip that slide back um, on here. That should give you all the details you need to know on that particular question. Um, it's typically it's 1.0.1 through to 1.0.1F is the version of OpenSSL. Um, this 
the webcasts are not designed specifically about how to, you know, the deep dive stuff on there. So hit the guys up on the vert side of things. Ask questions to support. They will be able to get you that detail. Uh, the vert team are very, very good at that. So apologies, I can't give you a direct answer now, um, but I don't want to say things that just aren't true. Okay, so um, I'll give it one more minute. If you've got any questions, add them on. Otherwise, um, we'll you know, end the webcast soon. I think um, other questions that have arisen previously, a lot of them are around um, how the secure scan side of things works and what you're able to do. I'm hopeful I've covered all of that. Um, I would recommend um, that the secure scan is that you make use of secure scan. It's incredibly easy and completely free. Um, I'm aware that there are, you know, there are issues around where the data is stored. So, for example, you know, we do assess everything at our, essentially our mothership. So, we use, put a connector within your network. We then run all the scans through there and then the information ends up back at a home thing. We have, there's lots of terms and conditions and all the information around how that works and how we secure it and all that sort of stuff is available. So please don't hesitate to use it. If you've got any questions around it, please ask. It's free. Um, I don't even get anything for it other than, I don't know, someone telling me that someone got it from this webcast. So hopefully something's come through from there. Thank you ever so much for your time today. Um, I hope you found it useful. If you want to add any ratings for this, please do. Any comments, feedback, all greatly appreciated. Um, so with that, I'll wish you a good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, and um, we'll end the webcast there. Thank you very much, everyone.